How are you, Tom? What's going on? It looks great. You're watching me. Now that's that's disturbing. Now I've really got to be careful what I'm doing off air here. But I should start. Hey, listen, I'm, I'm going to start uh, uh, quoting uh, the police every breath you take right now. By the way, th that that is the number one um, wedding song that should never be played at a wedding. You're aware of that? Are you aware of that? Was that played I mean, at your that, wedding, Tom? That wasn't played at your wedding, was it? Pretty sure, pretty sure not. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a little creepy. That is, you know, <laughs> at any point in a relationship, that's probably not the vibe you want to be going for. <laughs> I'll be watching you. Well, no, it is about stalking, you know. But every I've I've been at weddings where that's played, and I'm like, this is not appropriate. <laughs> well, is... th think about this too. That song was released in what 1980 something. something. Yeah, yeah, 83. And at that time, everyone didn't have smartphones, smartwatches, computers in their car, right. everything recording your every move. Uh, you literally had to drive around following someone in order to stalk them, as opposed to now. You can just open your phone, and if you turn on the right setting, you find out, hey, they're uh, they're down at the dry cleaner. Oh, right I know now. that. So I know really that. Oh my ahead god! Ahead of the time, really ahead of the time here. Oh, it's terrible. Again, you know, uh, how old are your kids, Tom? Ten and seven. Oh, girls. just you wait. And so oh, yeah, I'm uh, about no. to check out, uh, defer to my wife for about the next, you know, oh, eight to ten no. years. Because you know, my my oldest can now tell because uh, through geotagging on Snapchat where his friends exactly are. Oh, that's 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 no bueno. You don't want any pieces. Well, then of that. if they're all together, no, then, then that's a different story. There, right? That's oh, yeah. the that's the psychological torture. Why are they all grouped together and I'm but, at home? Back on the Rich Eisen Show Radio Network, I'm sitting at the Rich Eisen Show desk, furnished by Granger with supplies and solutions for every industry. Granger has the right product for you. Call clickgranger.com or just stop by. You know, it's not football season or anything close to football season when I spend any amount of time with Tom Pelissero, like I just did in the Roku Channel only segment, talking about wedding songs. Um, <laughs> I got a lot of thoughts on wedding. I'm songs. sure we, you do, we, Tom. We can do that all day. Well, and the season, by the way. It's not that far away. Do you realize 16 days from right now, Rich, the Ravens rookies report to training mm. camp. We are less than a month away from every team being on the field in training camp. We are 70 days away from the opener. The next couple months here, it's fantasy draft central. Mm. It's everybody getting hyped up about all 32 teams. This is the beautiful, beautiful time of year. So we can sit here and say we're in the break. You know, before training camp, I look at it as we are already in that ramp up that, you know, if the NFLPA gets its way, will be even longer uh, with players in training camp next year. No, I know that. And and that's the question. Uh, just I want to start here. Uh, we've had a couple players on. and I asked about reconfiguring the, the offseason, about maybe being in um, in a ramp up to training camp now, right now, uh, that leads into training camp and uh, not have OTAs and things of that nature. Um, we had, uh, who, was, who was the, um, the guy from, who we, who, we, who we have on who was really into that idea of moving it around? Um, oh. was, Definitely wasn't a reporter, I can no, tell you that. Well, I know that. I mean. No, Adam Thielen. Adam Thielen from Carolina. That's right. Yeah. He was way into that idea. But the NFL and the PA already said that's not happening next year, right? They already decided because they gave out the new league year dates and everything like that. Or, or... Well, they have to release they have to release those dates early on for planning purposes. But right. that doesn't mean that you can't have uh, changes later on. Right. As okay. of now. The off-season program, the April 7th, I think it is, with the new head coaches in 2025, that's on the calendar. But this is a very much a, a fluid situation. I mean, all these things are governed, Rich, by the collective bargaining agreement, and that runs beyond the end of the decade here. But with new leadership at the NFLPA, with Lloyd Howell taking over, Jalen reeves Mabins, the new president, they're kind of taking a look at some of these things and saying, well, you know, can we, can we take aim maybe at some things that don't necessarily make – a ton of sense. We've already seen them do it with the gambling policy, making adjustments there. Uh, we've done, seen it with some other lower profile things that we probably haven't even talked about. And this would be another one where, listen, everyone I've talked to, the consensus from a football perspective is that this makes a ton of sense. Why is the NFL the only league that has everybody ramp up to the best shape of their lives and then everybody go away for six weeks and then let's go right back into it and put on pads and do it even more intensely? It's more about the social aspects and the personal aspects of this that would create a great deal of challenges here. Uh, we'll see whether or not something advances and whether there could at minimum be tweaks in 2025. But this is very much 
something that I don't want to say it's a priority for the union because this isn't like this would be the chip that they would give, you know, want to get to give the NFL 18 games. But it certainly is something the union leadership and from what I'm told, the majority of players believe does make sense. And if the medical data sounds like it would back it up as well, it's something that the league and the union might decide collectively to do at some point. It's just a matter of how and when you implement it. All right. So then let's get to something that is apparently happening right now that could lead to something significant um in the short term and then obviously the long term is there is there any new daylight coming out of santa clara when it comes to brandon Ayuk and the 49ers finding the same page here well brandon Ayuk asked the 49ers for a meeting uh which took place i believe it was on monday Ayuk then told the media that the meeting was taking place uh, which has kind of followed the pattern for Brandon Ayuk through this offseason, which is whether it was staging a Zoom call with Jaden Daniels where he claims the 49ers told him they don't want him back, which definitely didn't happen, or it's him posting you know, cryptic and not-so-cryptic tweets about every report and rumor that's out there. But from what I'm told, they, you know, they had a good meeting. Ayuk has not requested a trade. He never did. He has not at this point. The 49ers have not changed their stance, which is – yeah, they listened to trade calls before the draft. They got him about Debo Samuel, too. But the price, if they were going to move either of those guys, was going to be high. Listen, Rich, we can, we can all talk about, you know, Ayuk saying, like, oh, I thought they were never trying to trade me. Well, 99.9% .9 of guys in the league are available at some price. Outside of a handful of superstars, star quarterbacks, everybody else, you get offered enough. You're, you're willing to listen on the guy. The 49ers listened on Brandon Ayuk, but they weren't going to you know, to give them away for less than a first round pick and probably more. So once the draft passed, they were fully focused on, we want Ayuk to be a part of the team. Could that still change at some point between now and the start of the regular season? Anything's possible if, again, some team comes out of the woodwork, gives Brandon Ayuk the contract that he wants, and is willing to give up huge compensation to the 49ers. Compensation that, let's remember, if it involves draft picks, can't help the 49ers in 2024 as they push for a Super Bowl here. It sounds like everybody's going to you know, take the next couple of weeks, 4th July holiday, everybody's traveling, regroup after that, see whether or not they can get to a contract extension that makes sense for Brandon Ayuk to be in San Francisco for the long haul. This isn't a situation where Ayuk has told them, hey, I don't want to be back under any circumstances. It is definitely not a scenario where they've said, we want to give away Brandon Ayuk. We don't want you here. It's a, it's a negotiation. It's about money. Can they get there on a deal? If they do, then he's he's locked up for a long time in San Francisco. If they cannot, then, you know, Ayuk's going to have some decisions to make. Does he show up at the start of training camp? Does he give up close to a million dollars or roughly a million dollars a week uh, during the regular season by beginning to miss games? I would think, this is just my speculation, but I would think Brandon Ayuk would show up before the start of the regular season. You play out the option year on your contract, then you might be staring down a tag in 2025, and we would see where things go from there. But they're going to make another attempt. We'll see if they can get something done. What what What's the number that you're hearing that he's interested in? Does he want to top uh, Justin Jefferson? Is it is that what we're talking about here? Or... or... I would be surprised if it's if it's into Justin Jefferson territory, just because Justin Jefferson's been an All Pro, he's broken uh, every record. Uh, it's it's hard to imagine that the number is going to go that high. But if you're a, a wide receiver and you're looking at the other deals that got done in this off season, I think that any top wide receiver who knows that their payday is out there for them somewhere, thirty million dollars per year is going to be a, a potential aiming point. You know, does the Ayuk deal go that high? Is it more in the Amon Ross St. Brown range, which I believe is twenty eight? at least on paper. Um, you know, we'll see. But obviously the 49ers haven't met Ayuk's number yet. Sometimes, you know, we, we all, I think, you know, fans, media, everybody's looking for acrimony and everybody's going to release their list of top five fits for Brandon Ayuk. It's a negotiation. There's different buttons that you can push. Some are more public than others. Ayuk has chosen to make certain aspects of this public. All the 49ers have said publicly and they've reiterated it privately is we want you here. We expect you to be here. Let's still try to work something out. Tom Pelissero, one of the insiders from NFL Network, NFL Plus, my colleague right here on the Rich Eisen Show. I'll ask you the question I asked Mike Florio last week. Who, in your best guess, is going to be the first $60 million a year annual payout quarterback in the National Football League, Tom? 
right now Dak Prescott's the one that's got the best chance because he's maximized his leverage at each point through the course of his negotiations, not just by playing out his deal and potentially playing it out again here in 2024, but the fact that the Cowboys had to use a second franchise tag to buy themselves time for the paperwork to go through when he signed that extension a few years ago. That means a third tag would be 144% of his original cap number this year. So you're talking about close to $80 million in 2025. That effectively makes him untaggable next year. And so for the Cowboys, if you're trying to get something done before he hits free agency, potentially even before the start of the season or training camp, 60 million very possibly could end up being that type of number. And and I know that there's been a lot of speculation in Dallas. I saw it again on a TV network this morning. Is this, you know, is this it for Dak and Mike McCarthy? Are they both, you know, looking to, to save their jobs here? I would still say, Rich, it's fair to say there's a possibility, there's a pathway where one or both of them still could end up having new deals before the start of the season. I think that in Dak Prescott's case, you know, Jerry Jones wanted those leaves to fall. A lot of them have fallen at this point. They got a pretty good idea what that number might be. You know, there's different structures you can talk about. You can talk about a shorter deal potentially. And with Mike McCarthy, you know, he's see, Jerry Jones has watched him lead a team three years in a row that's won 12 games. Does he want to push this all the way through the season? Is there a possibility something could get done? I wouldn't rule out either of those scenarios here, Rich, but Dak will be the one to keep an eye on just because that's such a huge piece in a marketplace that also, of course, includes Tua Tonga Vailoa. It includes Jordan Love. It's going to include some other young quarterbacks in the coming years once they become eligible here. But right now, you know, the biggest contracts, the market reset contracts, they're generally about leverage. It's hard to imagine somebody who's got more leverage right now than Dak Prescott. Well, unless it's Jacksonville and Trevor Lawrence, right? It's not like there was leverage there. It was just, you know, giving them – what um, they were happy to give him, I'm imagining, as well as figuring out by the time his contract's over, uh, $55 million might be a relative deal for somebody of his talent level as well as market value. And that's why I identified when I was talking to Mike uh, that just figuring out how it would work, obviously Dak, you said, has the leverage. That wouldn't be exacted till 2025, we're assuming. Um, and then there's Brock Purdy to go next year, which is also looming over the Ayuk conversation that's occurring right now. Um, and Jordan Love goes, Tua goes. That's why I'm kind of thinking maybe it's a couple of years until C.J. Stroud is the guy who gets to 61st. Like, that's the one I pegged. Just well, trying to throw a dart too. at the board here, you know. Throwing you that also year. have to look at this as percentage of cap. And, you know, the percentage of the cap taken up by the top quarterback contracts has gone from 15 percent or so a decade ago. So now all these deals are getting done at upwards of 20 percent. If you even look at the Trevor Lawrence deal versus the Joe Burrow deal in terms of percentage of cap, obviously Burrow was significantly more because the cap was like $20 million lower when he signed his new contract. So that's the other part of it is all these teams are budgeting out into the future. The cap had an unprecedented spike this past year because the COVID debt had been paid off. You got gambling money, you got new media deals. And I would anticipate that it continues to grow, probably not at a $20 million per year type of a clip, but it's going to continue to go up. So, you know, with regard to Dak and when he can exact that leverage, I would argue, I mean, certainly the maximum leverage is when you've got additional bidders in 2025. But if you're Dak's agent and Todd France has been doing this a very long time, he's got a very good idea of what the marketplace would be for Dak Prescott. And the Cowboys have a good idea that, hey, if we get into a multiple bidder situation, that's where it might be a Kirk Cousins type situation. And there only has to be one team to outbid us. If you're the Cowboys and you love Dak Prescott, which they do, Mm. you're best time to get a deal may be right now, but Dak still has that leverage because if he doesn't get the number and the structure that he feels comfortable with prior to the start of training camp or maybe the regular season, then at that point, I think that the the odds significantly spike that he's going to be putting on a different uniform in 2025. Before I let you go, uh, this also uh, gained some interest with our fan base when we talked about it on the show earlier this week was the, uh, the Ty Dunn report that that uh, Mike McCarthy has been uh, a little fed up with the whole concept of all in. And my response to that was, if it's true, can you blame him? What what light can you shed on on this conversation as we head into the Cowboys training camp season? I would say this, Rich. Mike McCarthy has worked for Jerry Jones for the past four years. 
every day that you work for Jerry Jones, who is a brilliant businessman, you know Jerry might decide to go on the radio or talk to the media after a game or say something that generates some type of buzz and creates things that then you're answering for the following week. Jerry saying all in, I believe that happened uh, at the Senior Bowl, is just one little fleck of paint in the tapestry of everything that has that Jerry Jones has surrounding that organization all the time, which certainly from a business perspective has helped Jerry Jones be a very, very, very rich man. At times from a football perspective, maybe some of that stuff is disadvantageous. I don't believe that Mike McCarthy is thrown by any of that at this point because he knows Jerry. He knows the conversations that he has personally with Jerry Jones. Now, you know, when there's a lot of wisecracks on social media about every time they sign another UFL player of all in, Cowboys are all in, like it, it becomes more, I think, of a media thing. Um, than anything else here. No, I, I don't believe that Mike McCarthy is is in any way uh, affected by something Jerry Jones says, but just because Jerry does so much. If anything, knowing Mike, and I've known Mike since 2007 when I got on the beat at the Green Bay Press-Gazette, going into a contract year as a guy who's led three consecutive 12-win teams, disappointing endings, no doubt about it over these past couple of years here. But Mike just wants to go out, kick everybody's ass, get a new contract, and go try to win Super Bowl. That That's his focus. At this point. <laughs> now, I'm sure it's his focus, but, I mean, uh, you can't blame him for a human moment to potentially share with somebody who then shared it with Ty Dunn that he's fed up. You know, like, this is ridiculous. Like, I, I want C.D. Lamb in here. We know we're going to pay him, so pay him. You know, I want Dak Prescott to not have uh, all these questions asked of him, so pay him. You know, Micah Parsons, the whole business, uh, obviously has no control over it. And you're right. It is part and parcel of working for the Joneses, which, you know, we both do, technically also, <laughs> you know. Well, Jerry, so. Jerry's got a lot going on. I mean, last year he was traveling all over the world. He had cameras in every meeting because he was having a, a documentary made about his life. You know, there's times where you're before the start of free agency and every team's talking about stuff. Jerry might be on his yacht for a week and you just wait till he gets back and you find out what you're doing. It's just, it's, it's, everything's a little bit different in Dallas. And that's just kind of, you know, part of the show here. I mean, yeah, it, Mike would love for, I'm sure Dak Prescott to get locked up and CD to get locked up and Micah to get his money. Um, and I do think still, not just Dak, but CD, potentially there could be a window to get a deal done before the start of this season, too. I mean, we're, we're sitting here in June. There's a long way to go still, a couple of months until the start of training camp. I think that, you know, as we've discussed many times, Rich, over the past several months here, a lot of other franchises would have been proactive in these types of situations with their franchise yeah. players, with their head coach. I can't remember any other team going into training camp, potentially with their quarterback and their head coach, both headed into contract years. But again, Dallas is its own animal. Everybody knows that, you know, that's why, you know, it's kind of, I chuckle every time that people keep bringing up the idea and we're at the end of last season of could Bill Belichick work for Jerry Jones. And I just have these visions of the Cowboys suffer a tough loss in week one and Bill's walking out of the locker room and Jerry's got every camera around him and is sounding off on what they called on third and eight on defense in the fourth quarter. I just, I don't see that match being able to happen, even though I know there's, there's certainly mutual respect and a friendship between those guys. Tom, greatly appreciate it. We'll chat again soon. Have a good weekend, pal. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Richie. You bet. That's Tom Pelissero, everybody, right here on the Rich Eisen Show. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free. 